order, Mr. Alistair. Oh, order, members. Order, order. Mr. Speaker, in, in view of your rejection of all amendments tabled, can you give an assurance that representatives of all parties in this House will be called today to speak in this important debate? Order. I can assure the member. I can assure the member. I will try and get as many members in as possible, and I'll be saying something at the start of the debate in around that particular issue. Having been given order, members, having been given notice by not less than 30 members, understanding order 11, I have summoned the assembly to meet today for the purpose of debating the motion that appears on the order paper uh, this afternoon. The business committee is really up to two hours for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose the motion and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. And looking at the, the point of order that Mr. Alistair raised and looking at the speaking list, there is quite an extensive speaking list of members who want to make a contribution. And I am going to be applying very strict time limits on members uh, this afternoon. Uh, I would expect members to police their own timings, but if not, I will police the timings of members. So I ask members for their cooperation because there is, as I say, quite a number of members who want to make a contribution here uh, this afternoon. If that is clear, we can move on. I would ask the clerk to please read the motion. That the motion relating to the judgment in the case of R and Downey, as detailed on the order paper, be agreed. And I call the Right Honourable Peter Robison to move the motion. Mr. Robison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I beg to move the motion in my name and that of uh, colleagues. At its very heart, uh, this issue concerns public confidence in the administration of justice and the rule of law. It deals with the trauma of victims and it relates to the right of this Assembly to have knowledge of matters that were within its devolved competence. The outcome of the Downey case was morally outrageous and an affront to justice. But more than that, it exposed to the full glare of uh, public attention a scheme that had been agreed well over a decade ago between Sinn Féin and the United Kingdom government. It was followed by outrage. That outrage, I have to say, was not manufactured or synthetic. It was real. It was an outrage felt by victims an outrage felt by those within the political process that they had been bypassed by the British government and by Sinn Féin. So what do we want to, to happen uh, as a result of where we are now, Mr Speaker? Uh, we want to find out who knew what and when about letters being made available to on the runs. We want to be sure that what happened in the Downey case never happens again. We want to be sure that those who are the recipients of these letters cannot rely on them to avoid questioning or prosecution or on the basis of information or evidence that is now or may later become available. There have been three approaches generally uh, about this uh, issue. The first has been uh, an attempt to uh, confuse. Uh, there is the claim that uh, everyone, including the general public, knew about these uh, secret letters and this process. Well, uh, of course, everybody in the general public knew that they were on the runs. Everybody in the general public was well aware that Sinn Féin had been pressing the government on the issue. Everyone had been aware that uh, Tony Blair and others had indicated there was uh, an anomaly. But I don't believe that anybody other than Sinn Féin in this House was aware that there was an administrative process and the provision of letters of comfort to on the runs. Now, it's no surprise that local parties were not told anything about the, the deal because in the court judgment it stated that Mr Adams expressed the view that it would be better if there was an invisible process for dealing with OTRs and that may indeed explain why this was done in secret. Again on the Nolan television program uh, the representative for North Belfast Mr Kelly admitted that unionists were kept in the dark because if they had known there would have been a crisis. Uh, the second approach, uh, approach, of course, to dealing with this issue uh, is to ignore the central issues and attempt to use the, the matter for cheap party political purposes. There are those who 
may wish to hide in the cupboard and whinge, uh, but they secured absolutely nothing from the, the government. Uh, why is it that uh, those who make the most noise often accomplish the very least? The third approach, of course, which is my party's approach, and I'm glad to say that of others, is to use the apparatus which is available to get questions answered, to get to the truth, uh, and that's the approach that we will seek to take. Let me make it clear that this uh, British government Sinn Féin scheme is and was wrong. Many people considered it had the impact in the Downey case of providing an effective amnesty. The scheme has the impact of doing what Parliament refused to do and doing it in a clandestine and inequitable fashion. This incident raises a, a number of fundamental issues which demand answers. We now have a judge-led independent inquiry and the terms of reference give the judge the role of making recommendations about any related matter uh, that is drawn, of course, to the attention of the inquiry. And that gives each of us the opportunity to draw issues to the attention uh, of the inquiry. It's essential that we get at the truth of all that went on in order to restore public confidence that has been so seriously damaged by this murky deal. I heard one uh, always negative politician uh, say it would simply be a paper exercise. Now, I would be very surprised if an inquiry into the provision of 200 plus letters did not involve looking at government papers. But the terms of reference make clear that the judge has the ability to take evidence from those involved in government, the police and elsewhere, and that obviously includes victims. Contained within the judgment is also evidence that the royal prerogative has been used in a number of cases. So it would uh, appear that some people's republicanism uh, has its limits. Uh, the RPM, of course, is used for those who have committed criminal offences. So we are not just talking about people uh, who there is no police desire to question or prosecute. We are talking about people who have been convicted in the courts and have been allowed to go free or who have escaped and have now returned covered by a pardon. Uh, but this is not just an omission by the government of the day, it was a deliberate deception. The Democratic Unionist Party made its position on OTRs clear before, during and after the St Andrews uh, Agreement. Indeed, when there was some speculation in the media that the Blair government had given Sinn Féin some assurances on the issue, Dr Paisley wrote to, to the Prime Minister in the following terms. In the past, concessions which were made to Republicans in order for them to be persuaded to meet the standards which apply to all other political parties have been destabilizing to the process. I would like your reassurance that no such concessions have been made to Republicans on this occasion. In particular, you will recall from St Andrews and before the importance that we place on no measures being taken of any kind to allow OTRs to return free from the fear of arrest. At that time, you assured us that no action would be taken in this area. This is in stark contrast with the undertakings which Jerry Kelly has publicly indicated that you have given to Sinn Féin. For the avoidance of any doubt, I would be grateful if you could once again clarify the position. The answer that there were no plans to legislate and no amnesty would be introduced was a deliberate deception, a deception by omission for the government could easily at that stage have indicated that an administrative process which included giving letters to OTRs was underway. So let me deal with the status of the, the letters. The public concern about the letters related to the extent that the recipients could avoid questioning or future prosecution. The inquiry must satisfy the public that never again will any individual be able to use such a letter as a get out of jail card but we must also ensure that no investigation is hindered nor questioning prevented by anything in these letters. The Secretary of State's agreement, and I quote, to take whatever steps that are necessary to make clear in a matter that will satisfy the courts that any letters issued cannot be relied upon to avoid questioning or prosecution for offences where information or evidence is now or later becomes available. That makes it clear 
in all cases that the letter, and I understand that there are many variations uh, of the OTR letter, cannot be used as a free pass. If the Secretary of State's statement is implemented, the letters cannot be re relied upon to avoid justice. The letters would have no substance or status in any court in the future. If the Secretary of State's statement is not implemented, then we will be returning to these issues. The outcome of the inquiry must be to ensure that nobody can ever again evade questioning, prosecution or justice because they hold such a, a letter. But furthermore, we need a clear explanation as to why devolved ministers were kept in the dark about a process that was still ongoing and, as we have heard today, is still ongoing even today, uh, after the devolution of policing and justice powers had been devolved to this assembly. And indeed, it appears that the fag end of this process is still going on. There can be no more basic requirement for any government minister in being made aware of matters which are relating to their own individual responsibilities as ministers and collectively as an executive as ministers. The impact of the recent revelations on the leaders' talks process has yet to be fully assessed. However, for me, it is clear that we were kept in the dark over key issues that would have been necessary for us to be aware of during the course of those proceedings. And it is already clear that proposals that have been considered will now have to be seriously re-evaluated. Mr. Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. I have uh, previously spoken about my, my frustration at the failure to date of the parties to agree a way forward on dealing with the past. Again, issues regarding the past, I believe, are being used to poison the present. Our efforts need to be refocused on the proposals that have been published by Richard Haas and by Megan O'Sullivan and have been under discussion by the party leaders for the past two months. I am frustrated at the stability of these institutions have been irresponsibly threatened this week and that a sense of crisis has replaced the much needed focus that we needed to get agreement on issues relating to the past. I am frustrated that those historically opposed to the peace process and to power sharing are being allowed to chip away at the process by using legacy issues as a vehicle to pursue their negative and rejectionist agenda. I have never kowtowed to the actions of so-called Republican dissidents, and I am frustrated that those on the extreme loyalist fringe are able to shape the behaviour of the two main unionist parties by using these issues at a time when there is a crisis in our a and &E services and our most vulnerable people are under threat from proposed Tory welfare cuts. I am frustrated that we are here today discussing a motion which is, is as irresponsible as the threat to collapse this Assembly. Today's recall and motion is about the upcoming elections and about the political posturing within unionism. Frankly, I believe that people out there deserve better. Politicians are elected to lead, and the peace process has been built on strong political leadership. Political leaders have stepped out of their political comfort zones, and they have taken risks for peace. At many times throughout this process, I could have walked away. I could have threatened to resign. I have not done that. I have sought solutions and agreement, and we have progressed to where we are today because of those agreements. The peace and political process needs defended, protected, and promoted by all politi political leaders. It certainly does not need to be threatened. As the peace process developed, a large number of legacy issues were thrown up. Some of these have been successfully resolved, and many others remain outstanding. One of these legacy issues is the issue of the OTRs. The British and the Irish governments of Western Park made a commitment to resolve this issue, and I quote from their statement. Both governments recognise that there is an issue to be addressed with the completion of the early release scheme about supporters of organisations now on ceasefire 
against whom there are outstanding prosecutions and, in some cases, extradition proceedings for offences committed before the 10th of April 1998. Such people would, if convicted, stand to benefit from the early release scheme. The governments accept that it would be a natural development of the scheme for such prosecutions not to be pursued and will, as soon as possible and in any event before the end of the year, take such steps as are necessary in their jurisdictions to resolve this difficulty so that those concerned are no longer pursued. And yet, seasoned politicians in this House have appeared on the media in recent days pretending not to know this. The scheme being used is not an amnesty, and it is not some get-out-of-jail free card. It seems to me that there are some here who have been for years beaten a law and order drum, now have difficulty accepting the word of British Attorney General about the legality of this scheme. Dominic Grieve has said that the process to resolve some of the OTR cases was a lawful process. So the political and peace process is brought to the point of crisis for no good reason. This is irresponsible. It is knee-jerk politics. So I believe we need to move quickly from the events of the past few days. Let us step up to the plate, start grappling with the real issues, not manufactured ones. There are issues uh, and real crises in our society. So if we're to get really serious about delivering for victims and survivors, and I am, if we're really serious about delivering for communities and orange order parades, and I am, if we're really serious about having, if we're really serious, if we are really serious about having a mature debate about flags, symbols and identity, and I am, then there is no alternative but to return to the Haas blueprint and build on this progress. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Mr. Thank MacDonald. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, I want to just remind the House that you know, we find ourselves today in a difficult place, a place that we shouldn't be in, a place that could have been avoided, and a place that should have been avoided and perhaps a crisis of some sort that we didn't need. Only six weeks ago, I stood here and said that I believe that progress could be achieved in the Haas process, but that progress must be achieved for the benefit of victims and survivors in dealing with the past as a whole. Civic society, in particular victims and survivors with substantial engagement and input into the Haas process, proved to be the strongest part of the Haas process. Victims yet again demonstrated a strong desire for resolution of the issues. And it's for victims and survivors that I feel, and it's for victims and survivors that we must deal comprehensively and ethically with the past. And if there's disgust expressed in this chamber today, it must be for and on behalf of victims. Having already suffered so much, these revelations of the past few days compound much of the trauma. In the Downey case, we must all sympathise with the victims and survivors of the Hyde Park bombing. The family and friends of those killed, and beyond that, all victims and survivors, deserve our sympathy. Their grief has been provoked yet again by the situation that has arisen. And if I could summarise, Mr Speaker, there seems to have been some sort of an arrangement in 2000 of a temporary ad hoc scheme to deal with an anomaly in terms of people that were on the run or uh, wanted for questioning or thought they were wanted for questioning. That worked in a small way. Then the British Government in 2005 uh, attempted to legislate a side deal that they made with Sinn Féin regarding the on the runs. And for many, that was a trade-off for many within the security forces who had serious questions to answer in terms of some of their behaviour here. Peter Hayne claims, if we can trust him, <coughs> that having asked for and approved the legislation, Sinn Féin was then pressurised by the SDLP to oppose it. Newton Emerson even tells a slightly different version of that story in yesterday's Irish News. But to many out there, there's a, there are hints in secrecy and in the mystery of some of these deals, there are hints of some sort of collusion. And the way the British government got round this is worth noting in some detail because they showed how cynical they were and the cynic cynicism that they embraced. The cynicism we were up against was Peter Hayne and the British government working with Sinn Féin to demonstrate contempt for our parliamentary democracy and antipathy and disdain for victims. 
The structures of government must be, and must feel to be, fully accountable to our people. Power must ultimately lie, uh, funda and fundamentally lie, with the, with the people on the street, the citizen. This is far from the place we find ourselves in today. As my colleague Mark Durkin said yesterday, we didn't work so hard to end a dirty war just to end up with a dirty peace. We don't even yet know all the details of all the issues involved, and this is the great difficulty. We don't even know what other secret deals have been done out there. We don't know what exactly the parameters of our discussion is. But we now must know if there are any other secret deals and who they're with. It's impossible to have a proper informed debate on the issues that haven't been fully disclosed. We must know, we must get all the information, and we must achieve honesty, openness and transparency around all these issues, starting by rejecting any possibility of secret deals going forward. And it's imperative that we do all we can to engender trust, given the damage that has occurred through recent developments. We cannot allow the potential to address the past on a comprehensive and ethical basis to be lost. If one thing has come out of the current situation, the fallout from the Downey judgment as consequences, it's the reiteration that the past can only be properly addressed on a comprehensive basis and that this must be progressed urgently. And we cannot allow highly unethical dealings to result in the collapse of institutions, our institutions here, or to undermine the good work taken to create reconciliation in our society. Parties to the Haas and O'Sullivan talks and the British and Irish governments respectively must re-engage and act decisively on addressing the past, otherwise it will come back to bite us again and again. Mr Speaker, we must all continue to strive to embed the trust and build the stronger, more prosperous, better shared future in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Mike Nasman. Mr Nasman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. All citizens are subject to the law, but some citizens are less subject than others. George Orwell coined the original phrase as a warning. Don't go there, he said. We have gone there. This scheme is perverse. You expect a loved one to phone the police and say, do you have any evidence about who committed the murder. You do not expect the murderer to be able to phone the police and say, do you have any leads that would end up with me going to prison? It is a perversion of justice. I was amazed this morning, listening to Radio Ulster, to hear the Justice Minister say he is baffled by what is going on. He's in charge. And let me remind this House, let me remind this House that at Hillsborough in 2010, this party argued against the devolution of policing and justice. We said it was a bad idea, the time was not right. And now we discover we are right. The NCA, the National Crime Agency, all citizens are protected by the NCA, but some citizens are less protected than others because of mistakes. And let us remember also, during those talks at Hillsborough, Sinn Féin sat knowing about the letters not just during Haas, not just during the last two months of party leaders. On Monday, as recently as Monday, Mark McGuinness encouraged me to sign up to the Historical Investigation Unit, a second police force, full police powers, no operational accountability to anybody. I knew IRA weapons are beyond use evidentially, but I didn't know what he knew, that operatives had a get-out-of-jail free card. Let me, let me be clear. For the Ulster Unionist Party, not only is Haas over, the party leaders is over. And it's over because of Sinn Féin and because of bad faith. We are here for the benefit of 1.8 million... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are here because of 1.8 million people, not 200. Sinn Féin are going to risk the whole thing for 200 people. We don't even know who they are. We have a fair idea, a fair idea what they've done, but only they know. It's selfish and it's greedy. Of course it's selfish. Sinn Féin, the clues in the title, ourselves alone. And greedy because having got the prisoners out, they then couldn't help themselves going for the on the runs. All citizens are subject 
to the law, but some less so than others in this country. Paragraph 126 of Justice Sweeney's ruling makes clear John Downey was wanted not just for Hyde Park, but in connection with a bomb in Enniskillen in 1972 in which two members of the security forces died. Is he making himself amenable to the police this weekend to clear his name? No. He's going party. The member, member give way. I will give way. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know many of you will know that this is very, very personal to me. When I was asked for a photograph of Lieutenant Daly, one of my best friends, I don't have any because he was blown to pieces. Last night, a tweet was put out by Mr. Weir saying we had a victory for victims. We also heard last night that there'll be Mr. Downey will not face prosecution. Tell that to the Blues and Royals families. Tell that to the Green Jacket families. Tell that to any of the, those that were hurt by the 187 on the runs and many, many more. All we seem to be getting through this inquiry is something that's going to clear up misunderstandings. Let's get back to the rule of the law. Let's get back to a process which brings in justice. Members bring it remarks to close. Intervention should Thank be you. short. Let's have decency. Let's have integrity. Thank you. And the member is not a minute on his time. May I thank uh, Mr. Kettingen and just acknowledge how difficult it has been uh, over the last number of days. And I know he's been in touch with the families uh, of those who had loved ones murdered uh, in Hyde Park at that time. I heard Sammy Heenan on, on Radio Welsh this morning as well, a man who lost his father. I think he was 15 when his father was shot. His father went out to work. The IRA were waiting for him, snuck up from behind, put him down on his knees and put two, two bullets into the back of his head. Sammy Heenan doesn't think this is a great victory uh, for victims. So where do we go, Mr. Speaker? We need answers and we need an end to the scheme, not just a question of no more letters or whether the mistakes are letters. There should be no letters on the face of the planet in this matter. No comfort. If you are on the run, tell us why and come back and sort it out through the courts. Have the courage to come back and stand over your actions. This inquiry, we fear, is unlikely to cut it. It's not what we were told to expect. But we will input and we will demand that it looks at how this scheme came about, not just at how it was operated. Mr. Speaker, if there is more, if there have been more dirty deals, tell us now. Tell us now, because we took risks for peace. Sinn Féin and others just took and continue to take. Marcia and the Jones. Ulster Unionist Party says this in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, enough is enough. David Ford. Mr. Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are clearly many questions that need to be answered. We will perhaps see some of them coming from the judge-led inquiry, which has been referred to already, but we don't entirely yet know how the appointed judge will interpret his terms of reference. Certainly, Alliance will be setting out some questions which we believe need to be answered in that inquiry. We will seek to use it to restore confidence. Would you we have to look at the member for giving way, and I do appreciate that he is uh, speaking in his role as leader of the Alliance Party this morning. But in respect of his ministerial resp uh, responsibilities in policing and justice, will he undertake to make a full ministerial statement to this House at the earliest opportunity? And will he confirm that none of the letters have been used or attempted to have been used to provide defences to charges in Northern Ireland on his watch? And will he further indicate that he is able and prepared to revoke? and rescind the applications currently in the system. And the members now well, a minute on to his time. Mr. Once Speaker, again, intervention should be short, should not be statements. I may answer some of those points in what I'm saying. I would perhaps have to seek your advice as to whether I can make a ministerial statement on something which is not my ministerial responsibility. It may be that the inquiry will produce some answers which will give reassurance, but yesterday I met with some members of the Northern Ireland Select Committee of the House of Commons most of the members from Great Britain were there and the Member of Parliament for Belfast East was there. It's unclear whether that committee believes that they will be satisfied with the inquiry. It may well be that they wish to set up their own inquiry. And of course, it's entirely appropriate that any further uh, parliamentary inquiry should be conducted by the House of Commons Committee because this is a Northern Ireland office responsibility. This is not a devolved responsibility. 
And let me just, in making clear that this is not an issue for the Department of Justice, remind Mr Nesbitt of one thing about the devolution of justice. If we didn't have justice devolved here, this matter would be entirely the responsibility of the Northern Ireland Office, and we would have no opportunity in this House. We would have even less accountability than the problems we have at the present time. Because as Minister... Briefly. Uh, the member says it's not a devolved issue. But if it's not a national security issue, and we've been told it isn't, then how would it not be a devolved issue once policing and justice is devolved? And if the situation is that someone in the NIO is usurping the minister's position, then when is he going to the High Court to quash the decisions Must made ask the to finish order. He stood on briefly. It is clearly not the Department of Justice responsibility because it is a Northern Ireland office scheme and I had an acknowledgement this morning from a senior official of the Northern Ireland office that contrary to what was being said by the NIO over the last couple of days that the issue was now devolved, they confirmed that this is an issue which they bear responsibility for the five cases which still continue in the system. That is the absolute situation. It is nothing to do with the Department of Justice. And as long as I am Minister of Justice, this tawdry scheme will not be in any way related to the Department of Justice. Yeah, yeah. Today, it's inevitable that the House is going to vent its anger over the scheme. Vent its anger on behalf of itself, on behalf of party colleagues, on behalf, as Mr. Kennehan has just done, of victims, and not just the directly affected victims in Hyde Park but those who are victims throughout, who feel they've been let down by the justice system. But the question has to be, what next? Mr Nesbitt says that the Haas process is over and the party leaders process is over. I'm glad that Mr Robinson used slightly more muted language, because the reality is whatever emerges from whatever inquiries there are, at the end of the day, responsibility comes back to this assembly, the five parties in the executive, ministers collectively, and the House collectively to do something about dealing with the outstanding issues. We can easily criticise. We've done a lot of criticism, and we will do a lot of criticism on this issue. But the reality is we bear responsibilities to be the people who change Northern Ireland for better. We have a duty to address the outstanding issues that haven't yet been addressed by the Haas process, which haven't yet been dealt with by the party leaders. We have to ensure that for the needs of victims, the moral obligation we owe them, and indeed a legal obligation we currently owe to the Council of Europe, that we put in place measures to deal with the issues of the past in an inclusive way which treats people equally. And we also have an obligation to build a better future for the people of Northern Ireland. We have that obligation to deal with the issues like parading, like flags, which have caused so much trauma and turmoil over the last 15 or 16 months. It's simply not good enough to say that we put the blame today where the blame lies with the Northern Ireland Office on this particular issue. We have to see how, whatever the differences we have this morning, we can actually build something different. We can build a different shared future for all of our people. I'm not sure whether it will be possible to get together in four-party talks over the next few weeks. If Mr Nesbitt wishes to absent himself, I don't believe the rest of us should give up on our responsibilities. It may be that while the inquiry goes on, it's not possible to get that in place, although I believe it should be, and I'm certainly committed to continuing that process. But if we can't do that, then maybe we need at least some way of engaging the wider public. Perhaps we should formally, as the executive, put out the Haas paper for public consultation to hear what the people of Northern Ireland, including victims, think of it, to help shape the discussion when we get there. What we need to do is ensure that we have a process which actually means we can come together. Because someday, whether it's next week or whether it's in three months' time, we will have to return to this issue. We have a duty to build a shared future for all our people. That duty looks more difficult today, but it's all the more necessary today. Yeah. Paul Gibbon. Mr Gibbon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At the heart of this issue is victims of terrorist violence and also everyone in society being equal before the law and equally subject to the law. The secret deal that took place with Sinn Féin and the, the Blair-led government that was continued by the Conservative and Liberal coalition to provide letters of comfort to Republicans on the run was a denial of natural justice. The Belfast Agreement was a betrayal of victims. But at least, at least it did have democratic legitimacy. This party campaigned ferociously against that agreement. 
The Ulster Unionists, the Alliance and others campaigned ferociously in favour of releasing prisoners and inflicting the pain and hurt on victims when they watched those people walk from jail. We campaigned against it, but ultimately the people voted for it in a referendum. This, however, had no democratic legitimacy. It had no basis on statute. It was an act of treachery on the part of the government engaging in a dirty deal with Republicans. Of course, Peter Hayne shamelessly comes on and says it's necessary to have bought off the provost so that there could be peace. Necessary to deny these victims the opportunity or even the basic hope of ever getting justice. The denial of natural justice can never be justified. I will. The member uh, for giving way. Will the member now then uh, share our revulsion and understand the revulsion of many within the nationalist community that the British government paid their informers and allowed agents of the state to willfully murder Catholics and others? And, 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 and their anger at that, and we share the anger of this dirty day. We share order, your order. anger at the dirty day. The members are not a minute under his time. Order. Well, and here we have the irony that Republicans on the one, one hand were being given a de facto amnesty, but yet want to pursue people that served in the British Army, that wanted to pursue people in the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Any wonder Whenever the deal that was put forward to Parliament was reneged upon, Sinn Féin got their letter from Tony Blair to say, I'm going to get this sorted out before I leave office. They knew they had a deal with them, but wanted to keep pursuing the state forces that they make all these allegations about, and therein lies the hypocrisy. Imagine, Mr Speaker, the response that would have came from Sinn Féin if three days ago it had been announced that British soldiers involved in Bloody Sunday and other state actors, as they want to call it, had been given letters and a special scheme was set up. Imagine the response that would have came from the Pat Finucane Centre, from Amnesty International, from the relatives of justice, all of whom have been silent when it comes to Republicans, of course. So the hypocrisy in it stinks to high heaven, and this party was right to oppose it and to take a stand against it. Then, of course, we've got the double speak, Theresa Villiers said. This was a Labour scheme that we inherited. Uh, it's now a devolved matter. Of course, we found out 38 people have received this. Whenever it became a devolved matter, they continued with the scheme. Alex Maskey said unionists knew about it. Jerry Kelly said it had to be kept a secret because there would have been a crisis. Basil McRae said he knew about this four years ago, but <coughs> kept it secret. I think members know if he, if he knew something for four minutes of this nature, he wouldn't <laughs> keep it secret. And then, of course, what we, what we can have in this inquiry is, let him tell us what he knew. Did he tell his colleagues in the Ulster Unionist Party at the time? Let's have this inquiry that we now have so we can ask David Trimble what he knew, what Red Jempy knew. So here in this... Well, we, 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 we will, this inquiry will ask anyone who has information. We're not afraid of the truth. Others are afraid of the truth. So whenever we have people putting up the smoke screen and Martin McGuinness is running about like Corporal Jones, don't panic, don't panic mode. Who's he really trying to tell Mr Speaker to calm down? I, sus I suspect it's the comrades in the IRA that people are trying to calm down on the benches opposite because they now know this piece of paper because of the actions taken by my leader and this party have now made it null and void. And let me put into the record exactly what the Northern Ireland Office has said. We will take whatever steps that are necessary to make clear to all recipients of letters arising from the administrative scheme in a manner that will satisfy the court and public that any letters issues cannot be relied upon to avoid questioning or prosecution for offences where information or evidence is now or later becomes available. Cut through the distraction and the smokescreen. That's the fundamental issue that this party has now secured. Others would say, let's go back to direct rule. Let's go back to My party leader and this party has used devolution to get the result that the on the runs are now again on the run. We have used devolution to get an Order. inquiry and Order. let us get to the Order. truth. And then we'll see who's making all of the Order. smoke Order. and the noises that they now try to throw up and distract. Let's have it on the record. We should be thankful 
All of us should be thankful because Mike Nesbitt never threatened to walk away from the executive. David Ford never threatened to walk away from his post, but my party leader put his job on the line and he's got the end result, and we should all be thankful for it. Order, order. Order, Jerry Kelly, Mr. Kelly, order. Uh, my order, Kion Collier, and uh, Sinn Féin will be voting against uh, this motion. There seems to be a lot of amnesia, historical revision, and downright untruths being paddled over the last couple of days. So let me put the record straight. This was first raised in 1999 by Sinn Féin. Again in uh, 2000, there was a, a public uh, announcement on September 29, uh, 2000, that a number of named individuals were no longer being pursued, 21 named individuals. So this is things that people seem to have forgot. In the Western Park, it was described as an anomaly in 2001, and an, impl an implementation group was sat, sat up after that. In 2002, John Reid, raised it in the British uh, Westminster House, House of Parliament. In Leeds Castle, there was a joint declaration in April 2003. Peter Hain wrote a letter to all MPs on the 20th of July 2005 and then followed it up with a statement to Westminster on the 13th of October 2005. There was, uh, in that statement, it was the, the need to deal with the OTRs. The policing board, as we now know, uh, which the DUP, the SDLP, and I presume the Alliance uh, were involved in. It was raised in 2007. No, I won't. The Ames Bradley, Ames Bradley report, which everybody read, I presume, order. since it was rejected. Or, or a point I, of order for Mr. Ford. Point of order. Is it in order for the member to erroneously state that Alliance was on the policing board at the appropriate time? He may do it on BBC, but he has no right to do it in this chamber. Order. The member has it on the record. Order. Members of the floor, let's move on. Further to the point of order, <laughs> if I can do that. That's, that's actually not what I said, but anyway. The Eames Bradley, the Eames Bradley report in 2009, which the DUP and others rejected, I presume they read it before they rejected, because in that they actually said there was 200 names put forward, of which 150 had gone through the process. The policing board again in 2010, and Peter Robinson said that they knew nothing about the process, but from Assistant Chief Constable, he started off his answer there is an ongoing process to resolve those individuals who mostly refer to themselves as on the runs. So perhaps, perhaps they didn't hear that either. I'm not going to give way. And, uh, and, Jonathan Powell, and Jonathan Powell's book, if I may continue, Nigel Dodge and the First Minister, of course, were mentioned there because they said it was acceptable as long as it could be blamed on David Trimble. And, and, and in the last few years, I understand that that Arlene Foster, another elected representative, sat through a trial of uh, Jerry McGill, which was based entirely on the issue of OTRs as well. But you're saying, of course, you didn't know about it. Aye. So no one at this point believes the unionists, and particularly the DUP. And just, and just let's go through it, because Paul Given already started this off. You know, the DUP were against absolutely everything. They were against the release of political prisoners. They were against demilitarisation. They were against patterning the new beginning to policing. They were against the, the Good Friday Agreement. They were obviously against on the runs. They were against the Irish language. And since we talked about them supporting things which were democratically agreed to, they haven't moved on the human rights. They are against human rights. They are against equality. They are against the Bill of Rights. And they are against the Civic Forum, all of which were agreed in the Good Friday Agreement. In terms of the latter, Kion Kolya, I will not. In terms of the latter, Kion Kolya, nobody seems to have seen the latter, at least that's what they alleged. So let me read it out and put it on the record, and I will put it into the library shortly. The Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has been informed by the Attorney General that on the basis of the information currently available, there is no outstanding direction for prosecution in Northern Ireland. There are no warrants in existence, nor are you wanted in Northern Ireland for arrest, questioning, or charge by the police. The police service of Northern Ireland are not aware of any interest in you from any other police force in the United Kingdom. If any other outstanding offence or offences come to light, or if any requests for extradition were to be received, these would be dealt with in the usual way. So now everybody knows what the letter actually said. And what this is, and I will put it in the Assembly. Order. And what this is. Order. And what. Order. Order. Must be heard. Order. Order. The issue, the issue, I can call you, of knowing the names, let's talk about the process. And this process, although it's concentrated on over 180 names, I can remember many years ago 
similar things happening. An individual comes forward, asks the question, am I being sought for anything? Uh, here's my name, here's my date of birth, and word will come back, and word will come back, as they come back in these cases saying, no, we are not looking for you. Now, that is a confidential, a confidential between the individual and those involved. So making demands, I don't even think, is legal in terms of wanting to know the names of all those Member I, stand, I, I stand. We will be voting against this motion. We shouldn't be debating this. What we should be dealing with is the issues which has dealt with. Edwin Pooch. Mr. Pooch, order. Thank you, thank you Mr. Uh, Speaker. I'll hopefully bring a little sense to it after the last contribution. In Northern Ireland this week, people felt a sense of betrayal. They felt a sense of anger and they felt a sense of distrust because their trust had been broken. And the fact that this process started a way back in around 2000, 2001, without reference to uh, Her Majesty's Parliament, without reference to this Assembly, or without reference to the general public, was a grievous breach of trust. The fact that legislation was not capable of being passed at Westminster on this issue was a very clear demonstration that both the public and Parliament rejected any notion of giving the on the runs a free license or a get out of jail free card. And the fact that Tony Blair and Peter Hayne and others in government went into a one sided immunity process that was offered to provos and to former provos while their representatives vigorously pursue everyone else that they should be held before the law is hugely damaging uh, to confidence within the community. Thus we are at the point uh, that we arrived at this week whenever our First Minister indicated that he would be stepping down if something wasn't done, and quite rightly so. Mr. Hayne told us that this was necessary for the peace process. The same Mr. Hayne that Mr. Alistair, for example, wanted to reign all powerful in Northern Ireland. This, the same Mr. Hayne who snake like got up this week in the House of Commons to defend the dirty actions that he was engaged in and people like Mr. Alistair wanted to continue to support. In Northern Ireland, Order, order if we ever, shouldn't persist. Order. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker order. if there was ever a demonstration of someone getting it wrong on an issue, it was so clear this week whenever we heard about the dirty deals that Mr. Alistair was prepared to allow Mr. Hayne, Mr. Blur and others to engage in on behalf order, of the people of order. Northern That's Ireland. That's not a debate across the chamber. I'd be very happy to give away if Mr. Alistair was going to admit that he was wrong, but I know that he hasn't got the guts to do that. I will, certainly. <laughs> the member, to the speaker, the member refers to Peter Hayne. This is also the same Peter Hayne who on Nolan this week uh, started to refer to the released terrorist prisoners as political prisoners until he corrected himself mid-sentence and connected, which gives an indication uh, of where Mr. Hayne is coming from in this. Yes, and I was happy to give way to a member who actually was able to achieve, the co to achieve the quota. And uh, uh, as I was indicating, others may put their trust in Blair, others may put their trust in Hayne, others may put their trust in Jonathan Powell and Alistair Campbell. We trust ourselves to deal with these issues, and we trust our party leader to deal with this issue. And that's why we're able to stand here in a stronger position today, because we have an evolved leader who's actually able to take actions and take a right stand. What is important today, Mr. Speaker, is that where people have done wrong, and where evidence exists that people have done wrong, that they can be questioned, they can be charged, they can be tried, they can be convicted, and they can be imprisoned for their wrongdoing. As a result of the Belfast Agreement 1998, supported, to, supported by my, my colleagues on the right, justice was dealt a hammer blow 
That process, however, allowed Jerry McGill to serve just two years to the attempted murder of our colleague, Sammy Bruce. That was bad enough, but for the Northern Ireland office, with Her Majesty's Government and indeed the PSNI, to engage in a process which doesn't even bring people to court or question them is a further compounding of damage to trust in the community that justice will be done. Thankfully, as a result of the intervention of the DUP this week, as a result of the intervention of the DUP leader, these letters no longer have the resonance that they had in this week, in the court this week. And whilst Jerry Kelly may be clinging on to the letters just as vigorously as he clung on to the bonnet of the Land Rover, they are now as robust as a case that he went to take against the PSNI on that Land Rover issue. I welcome the fact that the DUP took a stand on this issue. I welcome the fact that people can now be charged, can now be arrested, can now be convicted, who were former provosts, who are existing provosts, and I welcome the fact that we can have justice once again after it has been denied. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, Jennifer McCann. Order. Um, can I just start off by saying that really, if uh, this week has highlighted anything, and indeed this debate today in this chamber, it has really shown the importance of how we need to deal with the past. And more importantly, not to just people in this chamber, but the people who live out in our communities who have that expectation of us to deal with it. And put quite simply, if we don't deal with the legacy issues from the conflict, they will continue to impact on the present and threaten the future for all of us. And today's debate has once again illustrated that there are many different and competing narratives about the past and many different perspectives on what happened. And that aligned with the different political allegiances and divisions that still exist in our society adds to that complexity. I believe we have an opportunity to create a society where conflict and division can become confined to history and where reconciliation and respect can be the future for our children and our young people. And let's be clear, that's what people want. That's what people in our communities want, no matter what people in here want. So the legacy of the past must be dealt with if we are to progress to the type of society that those people want. And the Hass and O'Sullivan proposals offer a way forward. Alongside colleagues from other executive parties, we spent much of the latter part of 2013 engaged in these negotiations. <coughs> We came into the negotiations with a firm view that progress could be made and that the legacy issues in particular had for too long been used by some to try and undermine the very peace process which has brought an end to the conflict and created these political institutions. And I find it offensive. No, I'm not giving way. No. I find it offensive that the suggestion made by some on the opposite benches in recent days that we did not approach the Haas process with anything other than an intention for it to succeed a bit rich. It's particularly rich when it comes from people who have so far rejected the proposals and it's arrogant to claim otherwise. Because make no mistake about it, it was the parties opposite that tried to actually dilute and undermine the very mechanisms which would get those victims and survivors the truth that they needed and they want. Because they tried to dilute uh, well thought of the, uh, issues like the coroner's courts. And again, the needs of victims is what's central to all these proposals and what should be central in our minds here today. And let me say that no party can claim to represent all victims and survivors. No party can claim that. All we, we need to remember that the relatives of all those who died in the conflict experienced the same loss and the same pain as do the many thousands that were left with physical and emotional injuries. Regrettably, the human suffering that so many still experience cannot be changed or undone, and all those who were part of the conflict must bear the responsibility for that hurt and that pain, all the actors in the conflict. And no one should be treating the past as some sort of contest that can be won or lost, or using the grief and the pain of victims to score cheap political points. That is wrong. And if today's debate and the political posturing of recent days demonstrate anything, it is that these issues are not going to go away and need to be dealt with. Now, I haven't heard from unionists or anyone else to put an alternative to the Haas proposals forward. So we all have a decision to make. Are we con to continue as we have, 
allowing our troubled and difficult past to hold back the potential that exists in building a new future for our children and our grandchildren? Or are we finally going to tackle these issues in a comprehensive and sensible way? Because that's the choice we have to face. I, will, I do not, and I, I will never share your narrative of the conflict or the views of the orange state that existed here after partition, and you likewise won't share mine. When the, no one is asking that we should. No one is asking that we should. But that doesn't mean that we cannot agree on a way forward which can gain support from victims and survivors and break the cycle which sees issues like this used to contaminate the process, the political process, time after time. This Assembly has much more useful and productive work to be getting on with, and all this debate is doing by people watching outside is giving succour to those who oppose the peace process, those who oppose equality, and those who oppose power sharing. So I would ask all parties in this chamber today to be serious about dealing with the past, to be serious about dealing with the very real concerns and needs of victims and survivors in our society, and to work together, because there's a huge responsibility on us all, to work together to bring the Haas proposals forward and to deal with the legacy issues once and for all. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, could I uh, say that one of the most important principles in modern government is transparency. Uh, and that is a very good guiding principle, particularly for a divided and fearful society like our own. In relation to the on the runs, there was no transparency shown whatsoever by either the British government or indeed Sinn Féin. We've talked a lot about collusion in this House, and rightly so. But here was an act of monumental collusion between the British government and Sinn Féin. Their secret postal service uh, was a specially devised system uh, to, as it were, bring relief to their IRA members. It was not done for the good of the peace. It was not done for the peace process. It was done for the selfish individual interests of Sinn Féin. And that's the reality of the situation. I don't... Uh, uh, yes, yes. Apparently IRA stood for I run away. We have 187 men or women who did run away. What were they running away from? And clearly they are suspects and they clearly have a, a case to answer. The member is not admitted under his time. Well, let, let, let me progress my argument. This was a clandestine process. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, indeed, the Irish News yesterday uh, talked about this being the best thing, next best thing to an effective amnesty. Where was their concern shown for the victims of the troubles in all of this? by either the British government or indeed Sinn Féin. And let's remind ourselves that Peter Hain introduced a bill, the Hain Bill, uh, which was uh, to deal with the on the runs. And that bill, that bill was designed to undermine the rule of law because effectively if you'd been found guilty, you were immediately released. Uh, and it was such a monster. Yes, indeed. Yes, I, I thank the member for giving way. Uh, and indeed, on this important issue today, what people in the community are saying, what other shabby deals have there been with members of the security forces in the British Army? What other shabby deals have there been with security forces here? And indeed, what other shabby deals have there been with British agents, the likes of Frederick Scapatici? And how many people were sacrificed? in order to protect those people? Those are the questions that are being asked. I ask the member to and, finish. Order, and order, I, order. I have to order. say, it is often said that, that justice is truth and action, and I think it's about near time that victims heard all the truths. I, I thank the member for his timely intervention. I agree entirely with what he's saying. Uh, but let me get back to the history of uh, this particular process. Indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Kelly is a very deficient historian, it seems to me. Uh, the, the, 
Hain introduced his bill. The bill was thrown out uh, because of uh, uh, opposition, extensive opposition, the SDLP and others. The fact is that that bill uh, was uh, regarded by most people as a monstrosity. Despite the fact that uh, public opinion was against that bill and political opinion was against that bill, the British government reverted uh, to the administrative scheme uh, that had been in place for some time on an ad hoc basis. What they did do, they put it on a systematic basis. They institutionalized it. And, and that is the problem uh, as I see it. And that uh, is represented by Operation Rapid, uh, which uh, was introduced in February 2007. The preferential treatment of IRA men regarding their potential criminal liability was and is appalling. And it is totally insulting to reasonable, law-abiding people who play by the rules of society. How can it be acceptable to make an exception for these people involved in such serious activities? All of this attempted dirty dealing was done under the guise of, according to Mr. Hain, the peace process. At a time when the IRA had decommissioned their arms. It doesn't seem to me to be a credible explanation. Mark Durkin, MP, saw through the cynicism of these deal deals and warned about the dangers of making them. He said, we do not uh, end a dirty war to end up with a dirty peace. The days of side deals, shabby deals and secret deals should be well and truly over. Uh, what this on the runs affair attempted to do in terms of political expediency does not help to bring about a Member sustainable peace and healthy, open and accountable politics. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in dealing with this, let's not pull down this house. Let us maintain the valuable institution that it is, is and let us work to make that a better Alley. politics. Mr. Alley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I suggest that one question that will be on many of the public's lips today is, why are we here? Why are we here? Well, can I answer some of that? We are here because of deceit. We are here because of bad faith. And we are here because a process was carried out underhand. Included in that process were some people that are here, namely from Sinn Féin. I believe that process is unacceptable and it is unfair. But why are we here because of on the runs? Who were these on the runs? And I accept first and foremost that there may be some of those people who are classified on the runs have no charges to answer, who may be not guilty of any offence. But let us be clear, there are also those people on the run who are murderers, who are bombers, and who murder and killed innocent people in this society. And that is the reality. These people wouldn't have been asking for a type of amnesty if they didn't have charges to answer. Why didn't they come back, as a former Ulster Unionist Party leader, David Trimble, had recommended, why didn't they come back and face the courts? That is what they should have done and stood up to the courts, stood up to those charges that were issued against them. And then they... Yeah, happy to give way. Uh, thank you, Mr. Elliott, for, for giving way. Would the member agree with me that right now it's absolutely vital that we have a list of those individuals who have applied for this exemption, together with the crimes for which they have asked excuse, not least for the benefit of the victims, but also because of the possibility that we could be talking here about members of this House, Doyle Aaron, House of Commons, and the Northern Ireland Executive. Thank you. And the member of that amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I agree with Mr. Majimsi on those points, and it is absolutely vital that the, not only the people in this House, the members of this House, know the names of those, but that the wider public know who they're dealing with, that the victims know who may be on the run that may have had a, some responsibility in the murder or injury of their loved ones. 
Can I move on to the issue of victims? Because it is a crucial matter. And I listened to what I would term the weasel words of, of Mr. McGuinness, the Deputy First Minister, and uh, Ms. McCann. The issue is, how much thought did they put into the victims whenever they asked for these immunities or these letters of comfort? How much consideration did they give to the people who were suffering because their loved one had been brutally murdered and, as we heard Danny Kinahan say, no longer has he a photograph of his friend? If they are so concerned about the victims, and I agree with Mr. Majimseed as well, these letters need to be rescinded. Nothing less will do. But if Sinn Féin are so exercised about the victims, I challenge them here today. Why not ask those people who have the letters to rescind them voluntarily themselves? That will prove something to the real victims in this society. That will prove to those victims that Sinn Féin and their comrades are really keen to make amends, that they are really keen to help the suffering of those victims. Because if they don't, then they are proving, if Sinn Féin do not make that call and do not progress that, then I believe they are letting the victims down. But they are also proving that they are continuing in that bad faith and mistrust. So there is a challenge to Sinn Féin that I hope will be answered. But I, I do believe that we do need, if that doesn't happen, the letters rescinded. And again, I have listened to many commentators on the radio this morning, and there is no clarification as to the basis and the justification of these letters at present. Let us be absolutely clear, the only one way that will satisfy and end that debate and discussion is that the letters are rescinded that they are immediately written to those people that have got the letters and told they are no longer valid. That communication, that correspondence, and that letter is no longer valid. It is unfortunate that some people here have tried to obviously put the blame on the Ulster Unionist Party. And I hear that. Let's not forget some people did have the right to protest and object to various deals. That is their absolute right. But let's not for forget we had a new deal, we had a fair deal, and we heard that the end of all we heard that the end of all these concessions was coming after ninth or two thousand and five. Did they? How many letters have been issued since two thousand and five? Numerous letters have been issued and including including that of Mr. Downey's letter, which was 2007, long after the Ulster Unionist Party were no longer the biggest party order, uh, in this order, chamber. Order. Can the member so bring his order? Can the member bring his remarks to a close? What people order. need to realise is be open, honest. And, and, yeah, people, people may shout. People may shout. But the member's let them, time is gone. Let them stand up order, to their responsibility. Sorry. Order, order. Basil McRae. Mr. McRae. Order, members. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the First Minister opened this uh, debate with a phrase that I think went along the lines of, those that speak loudest often have least to contribute. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the threatened resignation of a First Minister is not a trivial, the threatened resignation of a First Minister is not a trivial matter. I have also been struck in the past few days about the ferocity of the opinion of Mrs Foster. And I also note that on the 5th of November 2012, the First Minister proposed a motion on Councillor Sammy Brush of the DUP. That debate was rancorous, ill-tempered and covered many of the issues debated today. I have to say to Mr Alban McGuinness, I find his position today inconsistent with the position that that party took on that day. When Mrs Arling Foster was winding for the proposition, she stated that the opponents relied upon two points, the Western Park Agreement on OTRs and the use of the Royal Prerogative of Mercy. Those issues were debated and dealt with. 
What is really surprising for me, Mr. Speaker, perhaps the First Minister would have been looking at it, is that there was an ongoing legal process. And I'm surprised that people did not look at Mr. Justice Tracy's approach to that on the 2nd of March. He would have been pleased that the Secretary of State's decision not to use the royal prerogative was upheld, thereby saying that the argument they're putting is not correct. But he might also have been interested about paragraphs 28, 29 and actually 27. When Mr. McHugh relied upon assurances given by a senior member of Sinn Féin, Mr. Jerry Kelly, in or about 2001, that he would not be arrested or charged if he returned to Northern Ireland. And further, that he was confronted in cross-examination with a letter dated 22nd of January 2003 from the NIO to Mr. Kelly, where it was clearly stated that Mr. McHugh would not be immune from charges if, if, or, or arrest if he returned to Northern Ireland. So the proposition that's put forward by the people opposite is not consistent. Why would Mr. Kelly have made these statements? Why would he have come along with it? Well, you can look to the House of Commons in July 2002, because the then Secretary of State responded to a question by Quinton Davis about 32 individuals that have been informed, have been informed over the past two years that they are not wanted for arrest, and a further 25 persons that the prosecuting authorities and police have confirmed they will not face fresh charges. Mr. Nesbitt, this was during the time when Mr. Trimble was the First Minister. This is an issue that you have to come along, and when you're going to withdraw from Haas, perhaps you could consider withdrawing Mr. Danny Kennedy from the executive if you feel that strongly. This is the line of information presented at the policing order, board, order, order. which outlined order. Mr. Paul Given brought up an ongoing process with regard to the on the runs. Mr. Gin Mr. Given asked me a question. My answer to him is. Why doesn't he ask his own board member, Mr. Tom Buchanan? Because it was his question that was answered. The, it made clear in the statement from the Assistant Chief Constable that there was a process. It outlined what would happen. It is consistent with what has been said, and they did not pick order, it up. Order. Now you can ask the questions. You can ask the questions about why they did not pick it up, or that anybody picked it up. There is certainly there is certainly an issue about constructive ambiguity. The constructive ambiguity that may have been necessary to get us to a certain place, but is now at the roots of the destruction of this process. This is something that we have to tackle. The statements from former Secretary of State Peter Hayne, which suggested that there was some sort of underhand scheme, are not helpful. This is not the way to go forward. The real issue in all of this is that we have strayed too far from the principles of the Good Friday Agreement. This is what we should go back to. The DUP have said they opposed the Belfast Agreement, fair enough, but it was voted for by the majority of people. It has democratic legitimacy, and that is what we should be abiding to. I will indeed. Would he further agree, Mr. Speaker, that not only, not only have the DUP led the order, order. about the Belfast Agreement, they are here because of the Belfast Agreement. Mr. Elliott asked the question, why are we here today? Why are we here is because of the Belfast Agreement. But Sinn Féin also have to know the challenge that the new Ireland they've wanted and got with the Good Friday Agreement. This is what it looks like. The Alliance Party have to face up to the fact First, ask the that member this to finish. is Order. what propping up tribal politics looks like. As Order. Well. I call Mr McRae. No intervention should be short, not statements. Mr McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The only way to deal adequately with the past is to publicly and transparently examine the proposition put forward by the Attorney General. We must draw a line under the past. We must adequately resource the survivors, and we must have a public debate that such an, uh, an arrangement will include agents of the state and those that some call terrorists. The Haas talks and today's debate proves that the alternatives do not work. Politicians must have the bravery to tell victims and the public that the only alternative to Larkin is at the best a continuation of this divisive debate and at worst, at worst a return to violence. This is the time for this politicians to tell the public the truth. Sammy Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Speaker. Um, there have been a number of issues raised here today as to why we're here and um, the, w where we're going from this. And the first argument that's been made is that this is all about posturing. That somehow or other, 
because there's elections coming, we have to raise the temperature. Can I just say, if this was about posturing by this party, why was the same anger expressed in the House of Commons on Wednesday? Across parties in the House of Commons, and indeed all of the parties who were represented in the House of Commons from Northern Ireland on Wednesday showed exactly the same anger during questions and during the statement by the Attorney General. This is a representation, I believe, of the rightful anger of people who were victims of terrorists and who now find that a dirty deal has been done with those terrorists. And I've got to say, if the Deputy First Minister can't understand the difference between posturing and genuine anger, then he has got no chance, and his party has got no chance, of ever bringing a resolution to the issues of the past. If all he sees is this is some kind of political stunt, then he doesn't understand one ounce of the hurt which he and his party and his associates have caused here in, in um, Northern Ireland. Of course, the second reason is this, and, is, and uh, this, should re this should concern all of the parties in this House. Had it not been for the stance that the First Minister took on this, there would be a clear signal to the, the current government in Westminster and governments after that that you can walk over the democratic institutions in Northern Ireland. Because that's what they've done. The Justice Minister was kept in the dark. The First Minister was kept in the dark. The Executive was kept in the dark as to what was happening. And of course, the public was kept in the dark, and even indeed the House of Commons were kept in the dark. So this was an essential step. The second thing, of course, is it was that you all knew about it. Well, of course, the Secretary of State has made it quite clear that no one was informed about it. She did not inform the Justice Minister or indeed the, the, the First Minister about it. Sinn Féin themselves have admitted they didn't want anybody to know about it. They wanted it kept secret. And I've heard references to the policing board. Perhaps Mr McRae and those who make references to the policing board ought to read what the Assistant Chief Constable said when he addressed the policing board. This is what he said that first of all, there would be an investigation into the individuals. If there was evidence, it would go to the director of uh, the, the Public Prosecution Service. If it passed the test, there would be a further uh, investigation of the case. Then there would be powers of arrest, arrest would exist, that the bench, bench warrants could be applied, and in the case of prison breaks, the Prison Act would apply. No indication there that there was some kind of amnesty for those who are on the run. And maybe if he had... Maybe if, uh, Sir, let's not have a debate across the chamber. So, as far as did people know about it, then it, it's quite clear from those who are involved that, of course, there is no knowledge. Though there is one thing I would say to the, the Justice Minister, and a, a question was posed by Mr Elliott and others. Who have got these letters? Since the police would have had to do a report before a letter like this was sent out. Surely he, as the Justice Minister, has the right to ask the Chief Constable now to give a list of all of the people who the police made a report on. And that, of course, would then give to this Assembly, and he could make a statement to this Assembly as to who has received these letters. And I will give way, yes. Mr Wilson is asking me to do, and I'm grateful to him for giving way, is to actually interfere in the operational issues of the Chief Constable. This House needs to be very careful about politics interfering with those duties. The fact is, this was an issue which is being carried forward by the Northern Ireland Office. That's where he should be asking the questions in the House of Commons. Well, I, think that that even, I think that even in his own speech he made it quite clear, and members of his own party have made it quite clear, this has moved from being an operational issue to being a very serious political issue. And therefore, I do believe he does have the ability and he should pursue that particular issue. That is one way of, of satisfying, I believe, many of those who have uh, been affected by this. The third argument that has been put forward is this, that this is uh, the, the, as a result of uh, the um, announcement yesterday, the First Minister has now made a climb down. I've got to say, I find that extremely um, odd, given that, first of all, he asked for an inquiry, and he has got an inquiry. And let me just remind this House what the Secretary of State said on the radio this morning. 
That inquiry will have the right to get all government papers, to call people, and even to find out and have a list of the, the, the letters which have been, have been granted, though I believe that the Justice Minister can get it. Um, and the, the, the second thing, of course, is that the, the, those who receive the letters will be co contacted. Um, Mr. Alistair, I believe, for different reasons, wants to believe that this is posturing. He wants to have a grievance that he can continue to pick up. We close. want to have the grievances dealt with so that those who have been hurt by this can have answers to the, the questions and to the hurt which they have felt. And I believe that we have got a good result as a result of the, the very Maskey. decisive action taken by the First Minister. Mr. Maskey, order, members, order. Gorman, I got I actually. Uh, I came here today, like the rest of my party colleagues, having said all of this week that we don't uh, believe that there is a crisis, that this crisis has in fact been largely manufactured. And I know Sammy Wilson was referring to that a few minutes ago about how serious his party views this matter. But then again, when I then heard Mr. Poots getting up, well, he's the minister for one crisis after another, so I realised maybe we are in the crisis here. And, uh, but on, on, on the. Yeah. There's, there has been, there have been, there have been quite a number. Order, members, order. There have been quite a number of, of, of hilarious comments and performances this week. I have to say, Kieran Kiola, because when you listen to all of the commentary this week from a number of unionist political party leaders and representatives, and indeed others as well in this house, also represented, there has been a lot of, uh, as I think Jerry Kelly described earlier on, as collective amnesia. The fact of the matter is, and it has been proven with one piece of evidence after another, one example after another, whereby there were briefings, public statements by Prime Ministers and Tishi, where there have been publications of, for example, the Eames Bradley report, go back to what, page 121, I think it'll sound corrected, if needs be, where that report which was published and rejected by the parties across the chamber. Now, one would have presumed if you reject something, you actually probably read it. Maybe that's not the case, because clearly, again, the figure of 200 people described as on the runs was, was referred to quite explicitly in the Eames Bradley report. So the collective amnesia, which is around the place, around this matter of on the runs, which has been dealt with, which has been referred to, which has been ventilated well and truly on quite a number of occasions over the last several years. So no party in this House and no person seriously involved in politics, never mind wider society, can honestly say that they weren't aware that the issue of on the runs was being dealt with and resolved. And I don't know how anybody can actually work out in their own mind how they can seriously say that they were aware a process was on their way, that they understood that, they were briefed to that extent, but they didn't know how it was going to work out. Well, as Martin McGuinness said the other day, they could have asked. And we do have on the record minutes where DUP members were asking questions of people like Assistant Chief Constable Drew Harris. I was at that meeting. So whenever those members, whenever those members had the chance to ask further questions, then they didn't do so. And you have to ask yourself, why? Was that a matter of choice? Was that a matter of hear no evil, see no evil? So the, fa the, facts, the facts on the record, the facts on the record, Kieran Kiola, demonstrate very clearly that those who are saying they weren't aware of this process clearly were. So I believe that the arguments that the DUP in particular have been putting forward, but not only them but others, are completely threadbare and I think they've been exposed to the public. And that takes me to another point that I wanted to make because when we're dealing with the, ca the case of, let's for talk's sake, say 187 people who have received these letters, that has to pale into insignificance against the backdrop because all of this is historical. All of this is about dealing with the past and has a context. None of these things were imagined by anybody. We are talking about 187 people or 200 people against the backdrop where we had 25,000 25, people from my community, including people like myself, served 140 or 150,000 years between us. We served the time. Order. 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 The member must be heard. Order. We, we served the time. We served the time on like, on like, on like Kion Kula. Those many members of state forces and others who were involved in murder, who were involved in killing citizens, who were involved in collusion and the murder of many citizens, including people like Pat Panukin, a very reputed, internationally renowned lawyer, 
And here we have members of the British Crown Forces, like Ian Fein, getting convicted for murder, going into sentence for a year, two years, walking out of prison and being promoted. Now, when here we have parties in this House who are proclaiming to be law and order parties and they want a judge-led inquiry, well, you had the Savile inquiry, you had the Widgery report years ago, you had the De Silva report, you had the Stevens inquiry, you had the Stalker report, and you ignored every one of them. You pretended that none of that happened. And a lot of it happened on your watch. You people don't like to hear it, but people in your society. Chamber order. Order. Don't order. 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 The final, order. Point, the final point I want to make, Mr. Speaker, is very simply this. We have the opportunity as parties to implement the Haas proposals, not like Meg Ness to take and get out of Haas Pass. We have a responsibility to deal with all of the victims, not only those that we choose to represent, but all of them. And Haas implementation is a way to do that. Mr. Bell, order, order, order. Mr. Bell. Mr. Speaker, today in this devolved <coughs> British Parliament, we arise to say sorry. We say sorry to Lieutenant Anthony Daly. We say sorry to Trooper Simon Tipper. We say sorry to Lance Corporal Geoffrey Young. And we say sorry to Staff Corporal Roy Bright. And we say sorry to them in this British devolved parliament because you have experienced the gravest of grave injustices. We, the British people, have failed you. We have failed your families. And in the name of a British government, we have failed to deliver for you your human right to justice. But let no one be under any mistake. The announcement of a judge-led inquiry, the announcement that those who have letters now are aware that the scheme it will now be satisfied that your letter will no longer satisfy the courts, that you can avoid being questioned or you can avoid being prosecuted. That, my friends, is only the beginning. Because like Churchill said at the end of El Alamein, this is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end. The announcement of a judge-led inquiry and the announcement that your letters no longer will satisfy a court that you can be not held for questioning or prosecution. That, Mr. Speaker, is only the beginning of the end. The Deputy First Minister, who hasn't seen fit to be here in this, for most of this debate, I will not respond. Point of order. The First Minister orders. was here for most of the debate. It will record the empty order. seat. Order. Let's not have the debate across the chamber. It will order. record, Mr. Speaker, through you the empty seat in the same way Frank Hegarty's family has an empty chair. Because the reality is those who were murdered by those with no respect for human life and the rule of law have lit, quite literally got away with murder. That needs to be investigated. I repudiate the Deputy First Minister when he says that it is a get out of jail free card. I repudiate it on the basis that he also gave Frank Hegarty's mother a letter or a message of comfort. And what a misnomer it is to call a letter of comfort because the inquiry has to establish was there a perversion of the course of justice. The House of Commons is free in a British Parliament to compel witnesses. And I would like our own Justice Committee to look at what appears to be the ultimate in collusion between the British government and IRA terrorists. Because British citizens are entitled to know how the Queen's royal prerogative of mercy was used to pardon the murder of British citizens. How can a royal prerogative mercy be used for people who have not been brought before a court and convicted for escape from jail? How can we have a pre-trial or a pre-pardon um, for those who have not been convicted? 
and the Minister of Justice, 38 of these letters were set out under your watch. And it was a that is the reality that under this coalition government, which coincides with the same period as the devolution of policing and justice, and at a time when the uh, coalition government uh, came to power under those beings, 38 of these letters uh, have been sent out. And the inquiry will also have to establish who delivered these letters. Did the person who delivered these letters, were they released on license? And if they were released on license, did they know the fugitives from justice? And is that not in itself a criminal offence? Because the inquiry will also have to ascertain what many of us wanted to ascertain. Is the person who delivered the letters of comfort so-called the same person who pumped bullets into the head of John Adams in the Mays Member prison? Bringer's remarks to a close. That is why we need now Amnesty International, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, the Finucane Centre, the Relatives for Justice, to come up and tell us what the situation is for what the a representative, Mr. Speaker, I conclude, said was Farry, nothing no, the short of the bastardisation of Dr. British Stephen justice. Farry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think, first of all, I have to correct the record in relation to the comments made by Mr. Bell towards the end. The 38 letters were not sent out uh, under the watch of the Justice Minister. They may have happened chronologically when the time justice was devolved, but the Northern Ireland Office have belatedly made clear that that was not the case, and indeed the, the members' own party colleagues have also made clear that that was not the case. So that is a red herring, which I think we have to put to bed entirely. I think it's important that we do um, focus on, on the future uh, as part of this debate, um, but I think it's also important that we do reflect on some of the challenges and indeed lessons that should be emerging from what has transpired. I think, first of all, we have a duty uh, to acknowledge that we have a responsibility to those people in our society who are victims and survivors, and also a wider duty to address the past in a comprehensive manner. It's not something that we can sweep under the carpet, such as NI21 would wish us to do. Also, devolution is important. I believe devolution is actually making a real difference but the, the successes of devolution are being drowned out by a succession of political wrangles and indeed the, the fallout from unresolved issues in relation to our past. And indeed it is important that we show the people of Northern Ireland that we are capable of governing and delivering on, on, on their behalf. And indeed whether it was real or exaggerated, we have to reflect upon the fact that we did come close this week to the, these institutions being seriously placed in peril or indeed taken away from us and indeed taken away from the people of Northern Ireland. That points to a wider challenge and that is to ensure that this process, this political process, is based upon solid foundations. If anything, as devolution transpires, we should be seeking to strengthen those foundations. However, whenever we have side deals, or anomalies in our process, or indeed what, what used to be called constructive ambiguities, then those will all catch up with us one day. We cannot tolerate those within our process because eventually they will undermine our process. It is clear to Alliance today, as much as it was a decade ago, that the issue of the so-called on the runs was an anomaly, but it was one that could only be addressed through a clear, transparent process, one that was somewhat analogous to the early release of prisoners, and I appreciate that some people found that process uh, to be rather unjust. But nonetheless, it's important that we, we did try to seek formal convictions for people who committed offences, and also that people go unlicensed, or indeed, if the opportunity presents itself, serve some time for that offence. That is what is consistent with the spirit of justice and was consistent with what happened in terms of the early release of prisoners. Most of us, however, have accepted that we have a peace process in Northern Ireland. It has been a successful process in the main over the past 20 years. And that has required a degree of flexibility and compromise from, from many of us. But the lesson must be clear that carve-up politics gets us nowhere. Carve-up politics is something that is not part of our peace process. It's no part of any solution and it's something that we do have to seriously tackle. And even today we continue to 
be enticed by carve-up politics. We must move away from all of that. Today we have the opportunity to begin to put to right what has gone wrong in relation to the way the issue of the OTRs has been handled over the past decade. But we cannot escape our wider duty to deal with the past. If anything, the necessity of putting in place a comprehensive pro process is more clear than ever. The status quo is simply not an option. We cannot wish this away. We are bearing huge costs as a society, and those costs are only set to escalate over the coming months and years. We have a duty to victims whose demands for truth and justice continue to go unaddressed as the, as the clock ticks and indeed as survivors pass away without, without having benefited from either of those outcomes. And we have a political imperative to address something that can imperil our political institutions. Yes? Member giving way. This morning, Seamus Close said that David Ford was washing his hands of the current arrangements that the NIO is taking this scheme forward. Will he encourage his party leader to identify, is the NIO acting legally by continuing with this process, if that's what they are indeed doing? And the members not admit that. grateful to that, Mr Speaker. Well, I think the, the review that has been um, announced will take care of that particular issue. But with respect to the Minister of Justice, he has not washed his hands of the issue. He has made it extremely clear this process should not be happening. And as far as he is concerned, he will have nothing to do with it, nor will the Department of Justice have anything to do with that. So, returning to the point I was making, we think we do have to, whenever this OTR review is brought to a conclusion, think about how we return to the issue of how we deal with the past. I believe the Haas proposals on the past were sound. They have moved the agenda forward by a significant amount. I can understand people's feelings about perceptions of bad, bad faith, but I do not believe that the proposals contained with respect to the past are fundamentally contaminated by what has happened. They still remain sound. And if anything, Order. If anything the, member the proposals are to close. Immunity, uh, which actually really reflect where people of Northern Ireland feel today, are actually on a much stronger footing than what has actually happened in relation to the, the, the process of the OTRs over the past decade. Time Thank you. Gone. David McNorry. Mr McNorry. Speaker, the First Minister said he was not prepared to remain whilst uh, kept in the dark, and I'm glad to see it. He's obviously seen the light today. I never thought of him as a quitter, more a fixer, and I say this to him, when you eventually go, make sure what you leave behind is fixable. In other words, let's fix this mess and clean up what other residue is lurking undiscovered. This is acutely a national issue involving our Parliament and all the people of the United Kingdom. The first known victims caught up in the twisted collusion between government ministers and Sinn Féin are the families of the Blues and the Royals slaughtered in Hyde Park. Their shock is expressed by Christopher Daly, who said justice has been thwarted, it was a dignified reaction to an appalling decision which rocked all victims of provo atrocities across our country. Who could believe that a government, but I suppose we could, but who should believe that a government, be it under Blair's watch or Cameron's, could contrive such deceit or stoop to such depravity in agreeing to such a dirty deal which effectively has turned the law on its head? The whole nation is outraged, and rightly so. This was a scheme designed for the provost only. It's called betrayal, and now we know who has been betrayed. This House did not sign up to it. Its executive did not discuss it. But now we can speak up for those who feel more betrayed than we do. We can speak up for the victims. However, to do so, and this is crucial, Speaker, this House needs to exonerate itself from any culpability carried out in its name. And consequently, I asked, what were the policing board MLAs thinking of when in April 2010, Assistant Chief Constable Drew Harris told them, it's on record, there is an ongoing process to resolve those individuals who mostly refer to themselves as on the runs 
a process, he said, being worked out through over the last number of years which continues to be available. I can see no gasps of horror recorded then, no indignant interrogation demanding an explanation of just what the process encapsulated in a minute, Peter, and no cry speaker of foul when hearing the process was ongoing for years. Chair, I thank the member for giving way. I uh, appreciate if the member goes on to read the full transcript of what is said, because probably unlike a lot of issues, this was something said in a public session, so it is carried verbatim. The Assistant Chief Constable then goes on to highlight the process as being examination of whether someone, there's evidence against someone, then indicating that bench warrants would be issued if there was evidence leading to a prosecution. That was what was referred to in that. Uh, and indeed, there was no mention within that of any form of letters or any administrative process. Mr. McNary, and the member is not admitted. Mr. Speaker, I take the member's point. I actually have the transcript. Um, I have read it. But what I didn't hear, and I continue in this theme, I didn't hear anyone demonstrating, has this been running for years? And saying out loud, well, this is the first time I've heard about it. Did they agree with it? Is that why the silence was there? Or did they not really comprehend what they were being told? And did they consequently tell no one else about it? I believe through the inquiry, Speaker, we'll find out soon enough exactly where we lie. So these, speak, these episodes, they need to be fully explored. And what more such an inquiry needs, as I've said, to be doing a job for the whole country within the United Kingdom umbrella. The motion represents to me and why I support it. It represents the righting of a great wrong by Her Majesty's government, a despicable wrong. And this House cannot slacken in its resolve to put that right. Inevitably, more will spill out if the inquiry does its job. And as I said, we need to fix, we need to clean up what has been a betrayal by a government. There is no anomaly here. Only a dirty deal, which let me say was not done in the name of thousands of law-abiding people throughout the United Kingdom, nor let me say was it done in my name and it must be removed. Uh, Jim Allister. Mr. Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The affirmation that justice in a democracy must be done and must be seen to be done is not just a catchphrase. It's a fundamental principle that underlies the operation of a judicial system. And what this sordid arrangement which the government perfected with the spokesmen and representatives of murderers and terrorists and some of the vilest criminals is something that goes to the very heart of undermining our judicial and justice system. It is something which subverts not just the political process, it subverts the judicial process. And those who perfected it were the British government and the IRA through their surrogates Sinn Féin. And of course, made worse by the fact that it was kept and secret, uh, so that it was something done in secret, behind closed doors, to be kept secret. And something which has done great despite not just to the justice system, but to the citizens who rely on that justice system, the innocent victims in particular, who plentifully believed that one day they might get justice, not knowing that some of the victim makers were walking around free of that threat and obligation. And of course, this is made worse by the fact that the in Operation Rapid, well-named perhaps, 
We now have evidence that it too was perverted because Mr. Baxter, the senior police officer who headed up that inquiry, appeared before the Northern Ireland Committee in November 2009. In the course of his evidence, he said this, you see, you would have to be so naive to think that the Secretary of State and his predecessors sits in Stormont Castle and does not tamper with policing. Lady Herman, with great surprise, says, tamper with policing? Yes, I would use the word tamper. One of my responsibilities before I retired was to conduct a review of on the runs. That is persons who are outside the jurisdiction. I can assure the committee that there was an extremely unhealthy interest by officials in the NIO about prioritizing individuals who were on the run and about ensuring that they were cleared to return north. That is what... The yes, I'll give one. Uh, th thank you. Uh, given the comments that you have just made, would you agree that there could be a case put that those involved in the creation, administration and execution of some of these manoeuvres could in actuality be guilty of perverting the course of justice? Indeed. But I think it does indicate that the political interference, the meddling, the importance of this secret deal was so important that the Secretary of State was prepared to bastardize the policing system in this manner. That is why when the First Minister on Wednesday said, I want a full judicial inquiry into all these matters so that we can see who knew, when they knew, what they knew. Those are vital questions to be asked and answered. I want to know who the 170, 187 people are that received these letters. I want to know who they are, what crimes they're believed to have committed. And he ended by saying, and I want all their letters rescinded. When he said that, I supported him. Because, because he was threatening at that point order, to do order, the right thing. Order, if he didn't get order, it. And he established two order, resigning matters. Order, he established a, there had to be a public judicial inquiry and there had to be a rescinding of the letters. What did he get, Mr. Speaker, in his climb down? None of that. He got an administrative investigation. A public inquiry under the Inquiries Act of 2007 is something where witnesses can be compelled, the floor, where order. they must give evidence under order. oath, where they can be cross-examined, where those who have interests like the victims will be represented. Order, order. The member must be heard. Order. Order. Where those order. Who, where those who have interests like the victims will be represented and will be entitled to cross-examine. None of that in this behind-closed-door secret review. It won't, it seems, even be in public. There will be nobody capable of being compelled to attend. No one capable of required to take evidence under oath. It is a farce. It is a whitewash. And as for the demand that the letters should be rescinded, well, Mrs. Foster, I think she was on the run herself yesterday after saying unknown, after saying unknown that rescinding was a resigning issue. That now we find, now we find all the Can Secretary the of State had to do was repeat what's in the letters already. Read paragraph 123 of the Downey judgment. It's already there, and if order. these letters are now worth nothing... Order, order, order. Mr. Atwood, order. Mr. Atwood, order, order. If these letters are not worth the paper... Order, the member should take a seat. ...then Downey could be convicted... Order, order. the First Minister is right... Order, 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 order. Order, order, or order, or order, order. Before I call Mr. Edward, let me warn the member at the back of the room. He may be trying today a publicity stunt, so he is thrown out of this chamber. The, order, order. The member will know the work we have done at the table to try and get every member in to make a contribution. The member then shouldn't abuse it.
Mr. Atwood. Point of order. That issue, will you then clarify as to whether or not uh, there was a deal done with the member so that his amendment wasn't accepted that he would get a speaking right in this House? Oh. Order. Let me make it clear. Oh, order. Order. That is not the case. That is not the case. I do not do deals with members. Do not do deals with members. Order. But let me further say that, order. Any member who has to be a contribution in this house then should not abuse his position. Should not abuse his position. Mr. Atwood. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. On uh, Monday night, um, some members in this chamber uh, went out of town and met with victims. And what they told us, to use their words, is that they felt marginalised and that the past was sanitised. And let's be under no illusions. These last number of days have confirmed their worst fears. And on Tuesday, down in the Stormont Hotel, there was a conference at the end of which many other victims felt that uh, they had more strength and had more confidence. Let's be under no illusions, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that those victims and survivors have less confidence and less strength today. And added to all of that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how must the families in Britain feel? The families of soldiers Bright, Daly, Tipper and Young. And how our own Danny Kennedy uh, must feel. So, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, Dan, Danny Kennedy speak, feel. Apologies. So, Mr. Uh, 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 Speaker, what are the conclusions that we draw from these events? The first is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the truth will out and that it has taken 14 years for what was agreed between Tony Blair, Jonathan Pyle and Sinn Féin to come out. So let's learn the lesson of that, Mr Deputy Speaker. Let's know about any other deals. And in this week, Mr Deputy Speaker, when a person in the Republic of Ireland was convicted of offences in relation to money stolen from the Northern Bank, let us know, Mr Deputy Speaker, what arrangements, if any, were entered into in respect of Republican or Loyalist criminality. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you cannot rage against some deals if you do not rage against all deals. And let's be very clear. At the heart of the British government, there are other deals, deals that have seen um, uh, the suppression of the truth when it comes to the affairs of this part of the world. At the heart of the British government, at the heart of the security system, at the heart of the British army, there is the suppression of the truth of the murder of Patrick Finucane. And that is another deal that is at the heart of our political process. So for those who rightly rage against the deal that was done between Sinn Féin or the IRA and the British government, you must also rage against those other deals those other deals that see truth suppressed and victims denied justice. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what is the second lesson to learn from this past week? It is that we have to go back to deal with the past in a comprehensive way. We have heard the advices and voices of Mr. Nesbitt and Rob Mr. Robinson today calling for a stop or a slowdown in Haas. And you've heard the other voices from the SDLP, the Irish government, the Alliance Party and Sinn Féin that we should speak. <coughs> this is a critical moment, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where either, despite what might have happened in the past, we stand in solidarity with victims and survivors, or we leave that all go up in a puff of smoke. But in doing so, let us deal with the past uh, uh, on not the narrow basis of the on-the-runs, but on the fullest basis, not in a partial, selective, limited, self-serving, secret, piecemeal and unethical way to dealing with the past, which will always come back to us. Third, Mr Deputy Speaker, let's be honest with ourselves that there has been a failure of politics over quite a number of years, that our politics is stuck and that people are alienated from this place and from the politics of this place. And that whilst we must apply ourselves to dealing with all of these issues that remain unaddressed in terms of the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, let us also recognise that we need the help of the two governments. 
and the party leaders in their meeting next week, and there should be a meeting next week, let them work through how we are going to work with the two governments. Mr Deputy Speaker, the if, yes. Will the member agree that we have to have conclusion and, and give some courage and actually help some of the victims who now feel so betrayed by what has happened? Uh, we, uh, we, I would agree completely with the, the member's comments, but this is the point. If Mr Deputy Speaker, the British Prime Minister, was prepared yesterday to take a baby step uh, in response to the requirements of the First Minister, uh, the First Minister who acted like the Duke of York, he led his troops up the top of the hill and he led his troops down again. If the British Prime Minister is prepared to apply his mind, even in that minimum way, to deal with this crisis, then he should, and the Taoiseach should, and with the assistance of the American government, they should apply their minds to help us deal with all the other issues. Because we have been found wanting. And uh, if we are not to be found wanting in the future, not only must all the deals come out, not only must we have a comprehensive way of dealing with the past that is ethical, we must also recognise that the two governments now should step in with us in order to resolve all the unaddressed issues. Arlene Foster to conclude on the motion and the member is 10 minutes. Thank you very much uh, Mr Speaker and since the Crown and Downey case judgment has become public there have been many attempts to confuse aided and abetted I have to say by some schoolboy journalism over this past couple of days but some of us uh, aren't uh, interested in he said she said we're interested in the truth we're interested in the truth and I listened to the usual tripe from the Deputy First Minister about mainstream unionism being influenced by the fringes. I expected that line, actually, Mr. Speaker, because there is nothing new under the sun. But what I didn't hear was one word of acknowledgement for the victims of terrorism from the IRA. Not one word, not one word. But then again, there is nothing new under the sun. And Dr. Macdonald told us that uh, there was collusion, and there was collusion uh, between Sinn Féin uh, and our government. It's not so painful to say our government were involved in this dirty, dirty deal. That is the collusion that took place. What is also true is that we don't have the full parameters of what was put in place, and that is so important. And that is why it is so important that the inquiry that has been announced will take into account any related matters. And just for clarity, that means that anyone can come forward with information, be they victims of violence, criminal violence, be they the special advisor of the former First Minister, David Trimble, so Mr. McNary will be able to come forward with any information he has. And indeed, Mr. Alistair can come forward as well. And I do want to address Mr. Alistair's point about me being on the run yesterday. First of all, I find it beneath contempt that he would liken me to an on-the-run. That's the first point I want to make. Second point, the second point, a victim of IRA violence is on the run, apparently, but that's okay, Jim. You, you have to answer that. The second thing is, if he wants to know where I was yesterday, I left the executive, which finished after four o'clock. I went home to see my children for two hours, and then I went to uh, an orange event in an Eskiln district orange hall. If that's where he wants to know where I was yesterday evening, I'm quite happy to tell him that's where I was. And he can check with one of his colleagues who was at the same event. So, yeah, well, he might have been in the cupboard, that's right. But I'll not be taking any lectures. I'll not be taking any lectures from a man that does absolutely nothing to hold the IRA to account. Absolutely nothing. He stands outside, he rants and raves, but yet does not come forward and helps and instead of trying to hold them to account, he sits in the back cupboard and says order. nothing. Oh, oh, order. Oh, order. The member shouldn't insist. Order. Allow the member to continue. Order. So this process, which was started uh, back in 2000, 2001, in fact, Jerry Kelly said it started back in 1999 today, developed in an underhand uh, and dirty way, a dirty deal to give a get-out-of-jail free card to cards who couldn't face the criminal justice system even if it only meant after the Belfast Agreement that they would face a maximum of two years. Such brave soldiers couldn't even come forward and put themselves before the justice system. 
We have heard from the postman of the letters, of the genesis of the scheme, and he referred to a number of documents, some of which don't even mention on the runs, such as the joint declaration of 2003, and I look forward to his reference in that document of the on the runs. But as always, don't let the facts get in the way of your spin. I welcome the presence, I have to say, of some victims of criminal terrorism here today, uh, to the gallery today. For them, this is a very painful day. It's been a very painful week, and I acknowledge that. Sinn Féin got a dirty deal, uh, special treatment for their own members. Of course, indeed, some of us remember very well after the Inniskillen bomb, we were told that we would get special treatment, that no stone would be left unturned to find who had perpetrated that awful atrocity. But of course, instead, it was Sinn Féin got special treatment in a very different way. Now, we welcome the announcement of the judicial inquiry, the clarification from the Secretary of State on the letters, but that is not the end, and I want to make this point very clearly today. We will be pushing, we will be monitoring, and making sure that we get the answers. We give that assurance today to the victims of violence and to the Northern Ireland public as a whole. Justice is often portrayed as a woman holding the scales of justice, blindfolded, as all should be treated equally before the law and equally under the law. Today, Lady Justice stands with her head bowed, battered and bruised, and we need to lift her head up again. We need her to hold her head high again, because for me, that is essential to confidence, not just in the justice system, but also in the democratic process here in Northern Ireland. Now, Sammy Wilson said he found it difficult to understand how the Deputy First Minister didn't realise that this was real anger and it wasn't manufactured or synthetic. Well, I'm not surprised Sinn Féin don't understand our, argue, our anger and our pain, and there has been a lot of pain. And indeed, uh, I want to say to Danny Kinahan that we do all feel his pain here today, well, some of us do anyway, in relation to his loss. They have always had a cavalier attitude uh, to the rule of law, but they need not underestimate our continuing determination to rebuild confidence, and that must start, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, with the five cases we've learnt of this morning, and the Justice Minister referenced them this morning on the radio, the fact that there are five cases currently with the DPP and with the NIO. They must immediately go. They have to be stopped immediately. I think that will be a mark of how this issue goes forward. And we will be asking that question of the Secretary of State very, very quickly. I make it very clear today from this House that we're not just dealing with the past, as we've learnt this morning, we're also dealing with the here and now in relation to this system. And we've heard from Basil McRae that we must draw a line onto the past. We must forget about the past and move on. But how we deal with criminals and the atrocities that they perpetrated goes to the very heart of our future here in Northern Ireland and the future of my children and the future of everybody else's children in Northern Ireland. The foundations must be solid. And the mo at the moment, they're in severe need of reparation, and we have to make sure that that happens. And we have to make sure that it happens in an open and transparent and public way to make sure that people regain confidence in the criminal justice system. Collectively, we must ensure that that happens. I hope that the House recognises the motion today is an attempt to do that, Mr. Speaker. I hope that the House will support the motion today uh, in the name of the First Minister uh, and the rest of my colleagues, and I look forward to the vote being a positive one so that we can send out a very positive message to the people of Northern Ireland and, indeed, to the people of the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Order, members, order. The question is the motion standing and the order permit be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Thought they have any noes? No. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes.
Order, members. Can I ask all members quickly to take their seats? Order. Order. The question is the motion standing and the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Put your ready nose. Do we have tellers? And can I ask the tellers to approach the table? Follows for the eyes, George Robinson, Ed McQuillan, for the nose, Katrina Rahn, Rim McCartney. Clear the lobby, the house will divide, eyes to my right and nose to my left.
oh, order. Can I ask all members to please take their seats? Order. And I would ask the clerk to please read the result. Order, members. 85 members voted, 58 members voted aye, 27 members voted no, 13 members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. The motion is carried. Yeah. Order, members, the motion is carried. In accordance with Standing Order 11.3, the business of the today has been disposed of. The Assembly stands adjourned. The Assembly is adjourned.